This time I went with the 14 inch M5 MacBook Pro with 24 gigs of RAM and 1 terabyte of storage. I wanted to make this my go to laptop whenever I leave the apartment to work at a coffee shop or a co working space, and I find the 16 inch model to be way too much of a hassle to work around with. After using the M4A, it seems like 24 gigs of RAM seems to be the sweet spot for me for being able to edit videos as well as having multiple IDE windows, browser tabs, and a few containers running at the same time while programming. And look at this no charging brick in the box for over a $2,000 laptop. How wild is that? But, anyways, of course, you know I had to go with the silver color. I'm sorry, but this is the only correct color for a MacBook Pro. But yeah, the upgrades this year compared to last year in terms of hardware are quite minimal, outside of the chip, of course. There are rumors of the M6 lineup coming in with a touchscreen and a OLED display, so my intuition is saying don't upgrade this year unless you absolutely have to. But of course, as always, I'll make a more in depth review video for you real soon, so subscribe so you don't miss that. Oh, and that new MacBook smell just hits different every time, I can't lie. Now, the onboarding flow is pretty simple, but let's go through it quickly. You pretty much just have to connect to a Wi Fi, sign in with with your Apple ID and create the user for the laptop. And if you're signed in with the same Apple ID as on your iPhone, then most of these settings get pre-filled from your iPhone. So I keep most of them the same, but just check these tracking features and make sure you're comfortable with them. And lastly, you can also transfer all your apps and data from another MacBook to the new one. But if I did that, then this video would be pretty much pointless. So I'm gonna do a full on fresh start and show y'all how I set everything up. Okay, then let's talk money. Whenever I get a new MacBook, there are a few must change settings for me. First things first, this dock needs to be cleaned up. Apple, I don't understand what the point of blowing in the dock is, but at least give us an option to select multiple apps to remove from the dock. I know there are apps that allow you to do this, but this should be a default feature on Mac OS. Then in terms of the dock itself, I keep the size around the default size, but for the magnification, I like making it pretty large. Another must do is turning on hide all desktop items because I accumulate so much stuff here. And something else I like turning on is the tap to click option so you don't have to push the mouse all the way down. Also, I like to toggle this hot corner so that I can quickly lock my screen as well as start and disable the screensaver. And lastly, let's change this wallpaper ASAP to something cleaner. This is from my wallpaper pack braces and look how sexy it looks with the new MacBook. I'll leave the first link in the description so you can spice up your MacBook as well. Then let's start installing some apps. And before we can install anything else, we need to set up the browser. For my personal browsing, I'll be going with Zen, which is a Firefox fork. So for the privacy folks, this could be a decent option for you as well. You might be thinking that the UI looks very similar to Arc. And yeah, it's pretty much a copy and paste in terms of the UI. And Zen is far from the most performance optimized browsers out there. But since the browser company dropped the ball so hard by not developing Arc anymore, I'm fine with Zen using more resources as the UI is just so clean. And and especially for my screen recordings, it's a must having a clean looking browser. Now, unfortunately, Zen is missing a ton of features from Arc. Like when you're playing a YouTube video and switch tabs, you have to manually toggle the picture in picture versus with Arc, it would happen automatically. On my work laptop, I've been stuck with Chrome because of my company managed bookmarks. But yeah, the browser you choose is entirely personal preference. For my specific use case, the UI is extremely important and it seems like Zen is the best option currently out there. I'm pretty salty about the Arc situation, but hey, it is what it is. And before we can start setting up the programming related stuff, we have to first install Brew, which is a package manager for Mac. Basically, it makes installing and uninstalling packages easy, which can otherwise be a pain in the ass. But just remember to run these last two commands to add Brew to your path. Otherwise, it won't work. Now we can finally start setting up the actual dev environment. Starting with the terminal situation, I'm gonna be going with warp for a few reasons. First of all, it gives you a really useful autocomplete for your shell commands, as well as nice themes you can choose from. But also recently, they rolled out some big changes that bring your dev environment and terminal into one place. So you can now view code divs, run agents in parallel, and a lot more right inside of warp. 
Next, let's set up Git and the GitHub connection. If you're not using SSH keys in 2025, then I don't know what you're doing. Generating the key is really easy with the SSH keygen command, and you can give your key a password if you want. I usually do, and my coworker made fun of me for it because I need to type in the password every time I make a comment. But I don't know, it's become a habit for me at this point. Anyways, after you run the SSH keygen command, you should have these two files. One of them is the private key, and the .pub file is the public key. And always, always keep the private key private. Then just read the content of the .pub file using a command like cat for example and in your github accounts ssh key settings add a new ssh key give it a name and pass in the public key here. Basically now whenever you make commits you can prove that it's you doing the commits by having the corresponding private key to the public key you just uploaded to github. Then let's talk about the code editor. Now this is the part where things can get messy especially with the ai field moving so fast there's a ton of code editors just popping up left and right and it's hard to choose one but i found switching around your coding environment a lot will likely make you less productive because you need to keep learning new tools all the time. So for my IDE setup I just stick to VS Code and WebStorm for web development related things. Both of these IDEs support really good extensions like Cloud Code and WebStorm even has their own agent Juni as well as Cloud Code support. So I don't know I never fully hopped on the cursor train and switching now just seems like it's not worth it anymore because these other tools are already so good. But the IDE discussion is kind of similar to the terminal or browser discussion. Literally just pick whatever you like using and if there's a tool that makes programming more fun for you than some other tool then of course just stick to the one that makes programming as fun as possible and as someone who works a lot with web related stuff i often bounce between multiple different projects and these projects can have different node versions and if you know you know but upgrading and downgrading your node version is a whole mess on its own so i like to use this tool called nvm or node version manager to take care of all of that basically it lets you install multiple node versions and then based on the project easily switch between them. You can install it with brew and then in your project's root just add this .nvmrc file and you can run nvm install as well as nvm use to either install or switch to the project's node version. Then a productivity app that has become an essential tool for me is Raycast. I know Apple buffed the spotlight pretty heavily and you can now do shortcuts and stuff on the native spotlight but I still find Raycast to be a superior solution for its window management extensions and overall I'm just so used to Raycast that there's no real point in changing. But yeah, with Raycast, you can set up shortcuts for opening your projects in specific apps. So for example, I can set up a shortcut for opening my TypeScript project in WebStorm, but then my Python project in VS Code. Also, you can see your clipboard history, manage windows, and they have a bunch of extensions you can install as well. Overall, I find that once you start using Raycast and you get used to it, it's pretty hard to go back anymore. For running local containers, I'm going with OrbStack, which is basically a lightweight version of Docker Desktop. With OrbStack, you can still use your regular Docker files and Docker commands but under the hood is just way more efficient. I used to run docker desktop in the past but then a lot of you suggested orb stack and after testing both side by side it seems like docker desktop used over three times as many resources as orb stack. So unless you're on like a NASA computer and you have infinite RAM then definitely go with orb stack instead. Another thing that changed since last year is that I moved away from insomnia to postman when it comes to testing out the APIs and sending out test requests. The reason for this is that I started using some services at work that provided postman schemas for all api endpoints they had and it was just way easier importing that schema to postman than setting everything up in insomnia maybe there would have been a way to get everything into insomnia easily but i'm not sure anyways the postman experience is interesting to say the least it just feels like the designers bloat max the whole ui and navigating it can be quite difficult at times lastly let's go over some of the other cool apps that i like to install right when i get a new laptop first things first i use this app called notch nook that basically brings the dynamic island from the iphone to the Mac, so you can use it to control your music, videos, or even use it as a tray for your files. Then to keep track of my MacBook's thermals and other system metrics, I like to use this app called iStat Menus. It's especially helpful for my review videos, but also it's just cool to see how your MacBook behaves under different loads. I also like to install Olama for playing around with local LLMs. Olama just makes it easy to install and run different models on your laptop. This is more useful on my M4 Max because it has way more RAM, but even with 24 gigs of RAM, you can still run a decent model nowadays. And when I'm editing these videos, I use CapCut and DaVinci Resolve. CapCut 
desktop more so on mobile for on-the-go editing, but if I need to create captions for a video, then it also comes in handy for that. For most of the editing though, I use DaVinci Resolve, it just gives you so much flexibility for color grading, and yeah, you can do pretty much whatever you want using DaVinci Resolve. Then for getting these cool screen recordings, I use this app called Screen Studio, which makes it super easy to add those zooms and smooth animations to a screen recording. But yeah, that's pretty much how I set up my MacBooks from scratch for programming and productivity. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.